Hello, I'm David Brody, the Engineering Analysis Module Product Manager. And I'm Karen Cole, the Bathy Database Suite Product Manager. Uh, welcome to the webinar. We're broadcasting live, so just to let you guys know that I have your microphones muted so we can't hear anything you say. And if you have any questions or comments during the webinar, go ahead and uh, enter those into the chat or questions section of the GoToWebinar dialog, please. And at the end, we'll uh, compile all the questions and answers and send those out to you via email. So today, we would like to tell you about functionality that we have added to Base Editor through the Engineering Analysis module. It is now possible to create raster surface representations of vertical structures like key walls, as well as other steeply inclined areas such as fjords, so that you can perform analysis, and especially so you can see how they are changing over time. For context, the Engineering Analysis Module, or EAM, has been part of the Bathy Database Suite for many years. This toolkit is designed to support decision making for infrastructure maintenance, and it is used by a number of port authorities and waterway managers. Most of the tools compare data to a model of some kind. The models can be simple, such as a single depth of 12.5 meters throughout an area. Models can also be complicated, with legally mandated grades along slopes to reduce side slope failure. We have tools in Base Editor tailor-made to easily create certain types of models, and we also support the Land XML model format, which can be created in software such as AutoCAD Civil 3D. Once you have a model, EAM includes several visualization options to compare data to the model, as well as various analysis tools such as volume calculations and feature creation. All right, so we're offering new tools to create raster surfaces for vertical and inclined areas. Can you uh, expand a little bit on why the traditional gridding mechanisms fall short in these, for these types? We're talking about dealing with data collected in areas like this one. The coordinate reference system for traditional raster surfaces has always been horizontal or parallel to a geodetic datum. That works well for seabeds and other nearly horizontal surfaces, but not so well for sloped or vertical areas, such as the areas around K walls. Key walls. What we have done is allow specifying new coordinate reference systems for raster surfaces that can be used for any planar area, vertical, inclined, or horizontal. For complicated infrastructure, like key walls in a port, there are many different planes with different angles facing different directions, but these planes are the same year after year. A number of different planes, defined once and used many times for various analysis, is a perfect fit for the reference models that are used in the engineering analysis module. The new functionality is based on using a defined reference model to store the planes that will be used for gridding raster surfaces. Each of the planes in the model is used as a coordinate reference system for a raster surface based on the spatial location, orientation, and other properties of the plane. You can use any source of points that can be imported into Base Editor such as sonar or lidar, and when you import them against the model, the result is a collection of raster surfaces that can be drawn as a group all together in 3D view with consistent coloring based on the distances from the plane. All right, so we're talking about working with survey data that's coming in as a point cloud, and we're gridding that data based on the theoretical model of the area. Can you explain a little bit about how the model is set up? Gladly. Each vertical plane has a spatial location, 
and it is defined by two XY locations and a 3D extent. The vertical planes can be rectangular, triangular, or even trapezoidal, so long as there are only two XY locations for the plane. Each plane has a direction, such as data values above the plane are positive, and data values below the plane are negative. For traditional cases of horizontal or inclined planes, that there's an easy convention. Up data above the plane is always positive. But for the vertical cases, it's ambiguous. So it needs to be defined which direction is positive. In addition, there is this limited distance around each plane that is set to define what data is considered when it is gridded. This limits the points that are considered. Imagine that there is a prism or a cube around each plane. Only the points in the input data set that are inside the cube are used to calculate the values for, that, uh, grass, for the raster surface nodes. So there are tolerance distances above and below each plane that, commit, that uh, control the dimensions of the cube. Once the planes are defined, 3D points can be imported, again with each plane being considered as the coordinate reference system for a new raster surface. The standard gridding methods are available. For example, there is an inverse distance weighting algorithm that considers how far each 3D point is from any relevant raster node. There are also biased algorithms that preserve the most extreme points, either the ones that are farthest from the plane or the ones that are farthest in front of or above the plane. The values calculated for the raster surfaces are relative to the plane, and these are the values used for the visualization, so by default it is immediately obvious where deformation has occurred or where there are features that need further investigation. In addition to the distances from the plane, the true 3D XYZ position of each node can also be queried or used as part of the visualization. And also, all of the typical statistical bands can also be created, such as mean and standard deviation. Alright, so you've explained about how we can make the grids and what it'll mean to, when we look at them, but what can I do with them once they're created? Well, what we have right now is that certain functions, like interpolating holes in the entire data set, are available. Perhaps most importantly, it is possible to detect changes over time by taking two different surveys, gridding them against the same model, and performing difference calculations. This allows the easy detection of areas of deformation that need further investigation. However, our currently released tools are just the beginning of our support. This year, in 2015, we are adding yet more analysis tools, including the ability to create profiles of raster surfaces representing vertical walls. We'll also add distance measuring tools to the profile window to identify the exact location of features. We will be adding volume calculations, both for single raster surfaces and also for the difference of two raster surfaces of vertical walls. 3D line features will be able to be created for contours at fixed distances from the planes and we'll be adding additional interpolation options. I think it'll be really interesting once people get a chance to play around with the new tools and, and use them in production to see what additional functionality and capabilities uh, they'll be looking for. Absolutely. I look forward to hearing from our users as they uh, try out and use these tools in production. Now, while it's all good to talk abstractly about this, let's see some of this in practice. The Montreal Port Authority has allowed us to use their data for training and demonstrations, for which we are grateful. Now let's consider this BSB in the Port of Montreal so we can get situated. 
You might notice that in this port there are many berths, many, many berths, um, along 26 kilometers of port, if I recall correctly, and much of it is managed through vertical walls. Managing this infrastructure cannot be an easy task, but Keras has been working with the Montreal Port Authority to build a good tool set to simplify this work. We're going to look in more detail in the area around berths 62 and 64, and an ECW might make it easier to understand. You see here that there's a vertical key wall, a corner with another vertical wall, and then a natural area with rocks of various sizes along a, an incline, and then another vertical wall. I've created a very simple reference model containing two vertical wall, vertical planes, one for this vertical wall and one around the corner, just to illustrate how this would be used. Once we have the model set up correctly, it, we can import the direct data directly and create new raster surfaces. This dialog looks pretty familiar. It's just the regular import wizard from base editor that our, our users are used to using every day. Yes, exactly. If you're licensed for the engineering analysis module and you have a properly set up model open, the import wizard gives you additional options, such as for the primary Z layer, there's distance from plane. Of course, you can always type in any name you want into this field. Some additional options that they give, that EAM gives when importing in this case, is three new gridding mechanisms. The mean distance from plane is the inverse distance weighting mechanism I talked about before. And there are two biased options, farthest from plane and farthest above plane. Until you have tried it out and know what you want to do, I recommend using the inverse distance weighting. Uh, based on my uh, exposure with the tools and the data I have so far. For this data, a 25 centimeter resolution is reasonable. So we pick an output name, the same as right, normal. You, retrieving coverage uh, from data, input data is fine. And like I said earlier, the standard uh, statistical bands can be created, the density, mean, standard deviation, and the part that's above and below. Now, this only takes a few seconds to run, but in a public webinar, a few seconds seems like it takes a long time. So let's go and continue talking uh, with a different data set. In the same area, the Montreal Port Authority provided us with an AutoCAD file with the model of the area. It has the location of the vertical walls, like we showed before. This AutoCAD file would probably be the primary base I would use if I was going to create a model for this area. So why not just use the DWG file directly then? The data for the DWG was built to, to support all kinds of port maintenance operations. But unfortunately, when I look at this data, no Z values have been populated in the features. In order to define the planes, we need to have a model that reliably defines the, the complete spatial dimensions of the planes. What about using a land XML file then? Land XML models could be opened and used absolutely. There's just one caveat. Um, when using them to grid, we talked about relevance distances when going through the PowerPoint, and LAN XML doesn't support that concept. So before using it to grid, you would have to set the relevance distances. However, that's easy, and we have utility functions to set these relevance distances, these tolerances, on all of the selected planes. So it could just be opening the LAN XML file, selecting the planes, setting distances, and you're ready to go in 30 seconds. Okay, so 
from the CWG file, I said that we have the 2D geometries, but I don't see any three-dimensional information. So when I was creating the model for this area, I went back to the chart, and I see that outside in the channel, it's maintained at a depth of 10.7 meters, and inside this area, it's 9.1 meters. I used the DWG file and the chart, and again, I created a reference model surface uh, uh, ahead of time. In this case, I created three horizontal areas, one out in the channel, one in the port, and one out on the surface. And that only took uh, a few minutes. Now, if I want to create vertical surfaces, I can do that simply by snapping to the existing points in the model with the horizontal planes, and it picks up the depths of the horizontal planes and asks no questions. It has automatically done everything I need to create the vertical planes. So we have horizontal, we have vertical. When I taught, looked here at this natural inclined area, I looked carefully at the data and it all followed a consistent cross section that looks something like this. So I knew that we have a pre-existing functionality in, in EAM to take a cross section and apply it along a line. So if I digitize a line along the top of the model here, and I say along this line I want to apply this cross section, and I confirm I want to do it for the entire area, it creates a 3D geometry. It might not look like much in 2D, but if we go to 3D and turn on the model I just created, you can see that the vertical surface goes from the top to the bottom, and in the sloped areas, it respects the cross-section that I had provided. So we have a model. I used a very similar model and imported it to get raster surfaces. And just to make sure I get the right one, yeah. If I open them up, turn it on, and turn off the model. You can see that we have a number of raster surfaces that correspond to the uh, planes in the model. One thing that I noted after I created this specific model is this feature, which is to prevent rocks from sliding down the slope. I had never noticed it when looking solely at the point cloud. The raster surface gave me an easy way to, to identify and consider this, this and other features in the model, uh, in the data. The visualization fundamentally seems very simple, but very powerful at the same time. Okay, so it seems pretty straightforward to take a point cloud and create a raster surface representation of it. There is some work that goes into generating the model, but once you have the model, you can use it year after year to create new raster surfaces for newly collected data, correct? Absolutely. And then you, would, uh, use, you could use the surface difference function to calculate the difference between the raster surfaces of subsequent years. Um, for the same vertical walls and easily detect deformations that have occurred. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our time. If you have any further questions or feedback, they'd be more than welcome. And we will be going through and replying to all of the comments and questions that you have sent us. We'd be happy to show you more about using these raster surfaces or creating models. Just let us know.